This is it. The completion of a journey that began in 2016. Total War's first foray into a fantasy setting sees its climactic conclusion from their partnership with the Games Workshop IP. Warhammer 3 is the ultimate finale that delivers as much of the Warhammer Fantasy universe as possible, stretching across the entire world map, brimming with a breathtaking selection of races, heroes and units, seemingly boundless in its content. In this video, we'll explore the third and final installment of the Total War Warhammer series, look upon the improvements made in both campaigns and battles over its prequels, and analyze the holistic state of the game one year after its launch, encompassing all DLCs and updates. This is Creative Assembly's Warhammer Endgame, the final chapter to its defining fantasy trilogy. This is Total War Warhammer 3, a year in review. In 2012, Creative Assembly and their parent publisher Sega announced a multi-title licensing deal with Games Workshop, the creators of the Warhammer tabletop fantasy board game, among others. This period in the studio's history saw various IP acquisitions that would allow Creative Assembly to branch out from its historical Total War roots, including 2014's cult classic Alien Isolation. But with 2016's Total War Warhammer, the fantasy universe was adapted into a modern digital format that meshed significantly well with the Total War formula of turn-based grand strategy and real-time tactical battles. This initial title was a precursor of sorts, focusing entirely on the old world with a major focus on the Empire of Man and the realms around it. It was the 2017 sequel, Warhammer 2, however, that saw huge player base growth and mainstream attention, as it featured a narrative campaign in the Eye of the Vortex and combined the Old World and New World realms into an expanded campaign map called Mortal Empires, with an acute focus on the conflict between the High Elves and Dark Elves. With fan-favorite faction inclusions such as Lizardmen and Skaven, Warhammer 2 brimmed with striking visual and gameplay variety that was propped up upon a strong foundation of Warhammer lore, a resounding sequel that appeased both Warhammer fanatics as well as more casual fans coming into the series. It took much longer for Warhammer 3 to stew. Another five years later, all bets were off. To bring all the magic of the eight realms together into one title, Creative Assembly not only needed to expand into the final eastern realms, add factions and their respective heroes and units, but also divulge a narrative and campaign experience that would be a fitting capstone to the whole Warhammer fantasy lore. Like Marvel's Cinematic Universe, the planned Total War Warhammer trilogy was never a development secret. Creative Assembly's intentions and roadmap were essentially public knowledge since its acquisition of the IP rights. They had wanted this series to become a major driving force in the outwards marketing push of Total War by attracting a whole new subset of fans. Betting on their tried and tested gameplay formula, coupled with the extra exposure from associating with the Games Workshop brand. Suffice to say, the previous two titles have generated huge profits and sustained immense player base growth. That hype for Warhammer 3 has largely been organic, a result of the progressive, slowly expanding nature of the series' content development. Total War Warhammer 3 officially launched in February of 2022. Its global-esque grand campaign map, the biggest in Total War history, and a dazzling array of new races and legendary heroes presents the pinnacle of the Warhammer Fantasy coverage, but also representing a degree of variety pretty much unrivaled within this genre. This video will explore the game after its year of post-release development through the so far three major update cycles, including analysis of the Ogre Kingdoms, Champions of Chaos, and Forge of the Chaos Dwarfs DLC. 
Now, I will preface that I had very little interest in Warhammer Fantasy lore. In fact, I'm much more of a 40k fan personally, but having enjoyed through the previous two prequels, it was an inevitability that I'd give this one a go, for completeness sake, if anything. And so we'll analyze the game from the perspective of a similar casual onlooker, or a Total War veteran who has not taken the plunge into Warhammer yet. Is this worth the steep entry fees? Well, let's find out. Warhammer 3 combines both the scopes of the previous two games and then some. By pushing into the reaches of the Eastern Realms, its story campaigns are the lengthiest in the trilogy, whilst its acclaimed Immortal Empires is the largest campaign in Total War history. Nevertheless, there has been major strides to improve the narrative and new player experience, an interesting development over its two predecessors. The first Total War Warhammer was focused on the Old World, a realm that features prominently the Empire, Dwarfs, Greenskins and Vampire Counts. Free LC and DLC added the Bretonians, Warriors of Chaos, Beastmen, Wood Elves and Norska. With Total War Warhammer 2, the map expanded further with four new realms, the High Elves homeland in Ulfwan, the Dark Elves based in Nagaroth, the Lizardmen in Lustria and the Skaven spread throughout. The realm of Araby allowed for DLC introductions in the races of Tomb Kings and Vampire Coast. With Warhammer 3, the map now spans the whole globe, with an eastward expansion from the World's Edge Mountains all the way to the lands of Cathay, and further to the wide northern and southern chaos wastes at the polar edges of the world. The base game thus features prominently the races Kislev and Grand Cathay, who hold the line against the chaos hordes in the western and eastern frontiers respectively. Chaos themselves are greatly reorganized, with each of the four Chaos Demons for Khorne, Nurgle, Slanesh and Zinch available as singular monogod races in the base game, whilst the Warriors of Chaos are reworked and bolstered by the Champions of Chaos DLC. As such, both of these races and their Chaos opponents are present heavily in the promotional material for the game. Although Kislev was already present since Warhammer 1, it was not a unique race. In this edition, it has been given a major facelift because of its pivotal role in the story. Despite this, there is a sentiment that Kislev is still one of the more undeveloped races we'll come to see. Grand Cafe as the Bastion in the East are also curated as a recommended race for new players and is overall better designed as one of the game's premier races. We'll also go through the extensive reworks to Chaos that now make that race one of the more compelling choices to take on. The Day 1 Ogre Kingdoms DLC and most recent Chaos Dwarfs DLC adds those respective races in the connecting central regions, the Ancient Giant Lands and the Dark Lands. Warhammer 3 features several game modes to enjoy this extensive premise. Of course, campaigns are the bread and butter of Total War, but even that comes with three separate settings to choose from. The Lost God is a prologue slash tutorial mode to the Realm of Chaos a condensed narrative campaign that pits the immortal forces against chaos forces in a race against each other, whilst the Immortal Empires campaign is the titular game mode that offers the entire Warhammer Fantasy scope in one large map. This was added in a major update post-release. Each of these will be explored deeper throughout the campaign section of the video. In terms of overarching narrative in the trilogy, Warhammer 3's The Lost God in Realm of Chaos is considered to be the lore prequel to Warhammer 2's Eye of the Vortex. As such, its place at the story trilogy's beginning makes it a prospective entry point for newcomers despite its placement as the last game in the saga. Of course, there's also battle mode where players can skirmish the AI or play one of the developer-designed quest battles from the lore. Every single race and almost every single legendary lord has a quest battle at least. These have been accumulated from the previous two games, so Warhammer 3 boasts a deep variety pool for those who just wish to enjoy some real-time tactical hammering. The Mirror of Madness is a new single-player mode added in April 2023 and features two sub-modes, the Trials of Fate and the Infinite Portal. Trials of Fate pits you as the newly ascended demon prince, facing endless hordes of enemies but imbued with powerful sorcery in an attempt to rack up as many kills as possible. Doing well enough earns rewards for the demon prince, which can be used in both the major Realm of Chaos and Immortal Empires campaigns. 
The Infinite Portal is an experimentation playground of sorts, where the battle variables or physics engine can be adjusted to provide some wacky outcomes like anti-gravity, ultra-gigantic, mega-explosion battles. It's pretty hilarious, although I don't know why this couldn't have been attached to the vanilla battle mode as a separate function. Multiplayer Wise has taken more strides to cater to a larger and more competitive audience with ranked matchmaking, blind faction picks, and a new domination battle mode. The inclusion of unique multiplayer campaign scenarios offer some more trivial distractions. Can't say I'm at all interested in any of this, nor are they that interesting anyway, but it is here for those certain type of players out there that want to share their experience with friends. Already we can see that Warhammer 3 in 2023 packs quite a punch in terms of content, especially after the introduction of Immortal Empires, which is what 99% of players are really after. However, to fully enjoy all that content comes with a steep price barrier, and this disclaimer has to be said before we proceed, because in my opinion, it is frankly unreasonable for newcomers. Warhammer 3 by itself only comes with the races it introduces, such as Cafe, Kislev, and the new Chaos Demons. If you want to play any of the Old World races, for instance, you need to also purchase Warhammer 1. Any of the New World races, you need Warhammer 2. Any of the corresponding DLC races, you need to again purchase that respective DLC from whatever title they were bundled in. The entire Warhammer catalogue is unified within one ecosystem, which gives value for players who have bought in since inception. But newcomers will be hit with three titles worth of pricing accumulation if they want to enjoy everything. So I really don't think it is worth it to be a collectionist, but rather one should pick and choose what races and factions they want to play. We'll have a full breakdown of the pricing model and ownership guide in the final section of the video. On the surface, Warhammer 3 is hardly a new and improved product. In fact, it scarcely improves anything graphically or visually from its predecessors. However, it's clear the developers have had more time to embrace the thematic motifs and art style of the lore. On display is an increase in world building and storytelling elements to present a richer showcase of Warhammer fantasy, but these positives have been shackled down by the underlying fact that Warhammer 3 was, and in still many cases, an unfinished, rush to release product. There is no major improvement in the graphics department, as Warhammer 3 uses the same engine as the previous two iterations. However, there is much more graphical variety, especially in battle mode, with new races introducing new units, new battle locations in new exotic regions of the world, and even in other dimensions such as within the Realms of Chaos campaign. The campaign maps are expanded and brushed with a new coat of darker, moody texturization. The Chaos Wastes, the Darklands, and the Far East represent new environments, so it'll still feel like a relatively novel experience for even veterans of the trilogy, at least for a little while. The UI also has gotten major tweaks. The main menu for one is so much better than previous iterations and resembles the cleaner Total War look from games past. Campaign selection through to choosing races and leaders, examining their start positions before selecting game conditions, it's all much cleaner now with plenty of space freed up to show off Warhammer's infectious art style. Battle mode has got an interface quality of life reworks with full customization options to fine tune the information on display. Although I very much dislike the default setting, so I'd recommend to change this, especially in regards to unit highlighting. Talking about the art style, there has definitely been a conscious attempt at providing more visuals, footage and artwork. I believe this is in line with the improved narrative experience as Warhammer 3 offers much more of an immersive dive into the lore of the universe. It's very obvious when playing through the Lost God and Realm of Chaos storylines as the way these campaigns are set up almost plays like a CRPG with the combination of pre-rendered movies and in-game cutscenes alongside strong voice acting performances. The UI is mostly the same for every race in the game though, there are some changes in visual effects and art featurettes to at least provide some immersion into the culture and history of said race, but besides a colour palette change, I would have liked a bit more differentiation. And this is where Warhammer 3 starts to feel a bit samey in some regards. Building icons, fonts and panels, I just feel like there could have been much more effort on this front for this final part 3. 
but I guess it's not something worth prioritizing. Warhammer 3, alongside its range of DLCs, features an extensive soundtrack, reprising the same composer team from the first two games and other recent titles such as Total War Three Kingdoms. The new racers are even dedicated several of their own unique tracks, Kislev, Grand Cafe, and the new Chaos varieties all feature their own flavorful albums. But unlike Three Kingdoms or Rome 2 slash Attila, which had very distinct emotional styles, I can't shake the feeling that Warhammer 3 sounds awfully similar across all the races without their own discernible touch of, I don't know, character? This might have something to do with the dynamic audio present in the trilogy, which essentially has the same backing track with variations mastered in, depending on what the player is doing in-game. All the races introduced in the prequel seemingly have the same music just ported over, so overall the soundtrack is bland in some cases and passable in others. The sound design though feels much more visceral. I can't find a proper confirmation on this, but I can swear the audio production has been elevated a notch from previous titles. This is quite obvious if you load up a battle and experience the action on the ground. Battles are a tremendous cacophony of beastly bellowing, horns and sirens, gunfire and a clash of iron and steel. And it makes Warhammer 3 one of the more satisfying games for fantasy warfare ambience. So, my verdict? Turn the music off and instead enjoy the rich soundscape. A massive indictment against this game though, despite its 5 years of development since Warhammer 2, was its terrible state at launch. More than a year later and some of these problems have either been ignored, led to fester into bigger issues or simply plastered over. I'm not going to harp too much on this point as it's been regurgitated by other people many times over. But it is of my opinion it shouldn't have been released in 2022 at all, or at least delayed by 6 months. At launch it lingered at mixed to mostly negative reviews on Steam for several months, almost entirely due to performance issues. At least on the communication front, Creative Assembly has improved over the last year. In April 2023, they launched a known issues thread on the Steam support forums, listing all known bugs and any that were fixed, so players can immediately pinpoint something that needs to be reported or waited on to be patched. Roadmaps have promised more optimization improvements, but the going is still rough. Total War Warhammer 3 is a mighty guzzler of graphics and CPU power, and even the strongest of systems will only just surpass 60 frames per second. And with its mighty campaign scope, you can expect Total War's long history of campaign issues even more amplified, with stuttering on the campaign map and lengthy end turn times. Finally, the issue of artificial intelligence. Again, it's probably the result of this expanded map and the inclusion of so many different races and factions that the devs have struggled to implement a competent AI. This seems like an ever-present problem in the Warhammer trilogy that has only gotten worse. Part of me thinks they have tried to code a general campaign AI for certain racial subgroups to save some time. Horde factions such as Beastmen, Skaven and Greenskins are particularly suicidal, whilst mighty old world conglomerates of Bretonia, the Empire, Kislev and Dwarves are almost always overrun by the mid-game, failing to put up a concerted effort to defend themselves. Although there's probably some balancing issues at work here as well. Battles are the same old AI I guess, I don't think the battle AI has seen a tangible improvement since Total War Attila to be honest. But in Sieges, it is perhaps even more woeful thanks to the new opinionated Siege reworks. Different players will have different perspectives on this topic, but again, it's already covered enough across the content creator space. Warhammer 3's grandiose scale and scope has obviously caused problems with balancing and optimizing the game, no doubt given lesser prioritization against the pursuit of a richer overall presentation. Whether by publisher demands, player base hype, or their own naivety, Creative Assembly have shipped the game out far too early for their own good, so that more than a year after release, they're still playing catch up to all the various issues anchoring down the game's reputation. 
As a result, anyone buying into this project must expect an unfinished article and many more years of optimization work. Warhammer 3's featurette of three different campaign settings will give plenty of content for those looking for either a narrative-based scenario or more of a sandbox long play. However, the value of the two story campaigns are of questionable appeal due to their gameplay direction, whilst the long time coming Immortal Empires is ultimately the main draw of Warhammer 3 in 2023. The Lost God is a prologue that serves as a part tutorial, part prequel story arc that connects into the main story campaign in the Realm of Chaos. Players command the Kislev Prince Yuri Barkov, sent by the Tsarina North to find the Kislevites lost bear god Urson. Along the way, new players will be taught on the basics of campaign mechanics and battle tactics. The Lost God campaign, however, plays like an interactive movie with cutscenes and movie sequences interspersed with very limited actual true campaign play. As Prince Yuri is the protagonist, it feels as though the Lost God is more of a CRPG following his story and his band of companions as they trek across the northern chaos wastes in an adventure-like turn-based tactical format. The intimate scope does allow for much more dramatic storytelling about the prince and his eventual corruption to darkness, becoming the demon prince that leads the Legion of Chaos in the later campaigns. A solid one or two hours to marinate in the narrative juices and recommended viewing for anyone interested in the lore. The Realm of Chaos is a much beefier campaign that follows up geopolitically from where the Lost God finishes. With Urson dying in his chaos-induced prison, it is up to the races of the mortal plane to take the fight into Chaos Lands and free the God Bear. Each faction has their own agenda on what to do with Urson. As a result, I recommend playing as Kislev for continuity's sake from the Lost God campaign, but all of the new races can be played as the map centers in the Northern Old World. This campaign, however, is a terrible, terrible bore with poor pacing design. You have to wait until Urson periodically roars, which opens up chaos portals that grant access to the realms of the four chaos gods. The player must then race against other factions to traverse each realm and defeat each of the Chaos God's protectors to collect four souls. For an opportunity to have one final showdown against Belakor, the Demon Prince, ensnaring Urson, or while Chaos incursions pour into the mortal plane the other way. Each realm has their own twists and challenges. The Nurgle realm is full of plague and poison, forcing players to methodically wade through the attrition. The Corn Realm requires a certain amount of bloodshed before allowing passage. The Zinch Realm is a maze of sigils and gateways. Whilst the Realm of Slanesh requires players to traverse down the levels all while trying to resist temptations. The problem is, the gameplay loop doesn't feel like Total War at all. It again feels like a CRPG where you try to assemble a perfect stack of units and await perfect conditions in a race against time. Because only the faction leader's army can enter the chaos portals, and because there are a limited number of turns until the portals close, and because you can only attempt one portal every time Urson roars, the entire playthrough can be tens of hours of grindy, boring waiting around, simply clicking the end turn button. If another faction takes a soul before you can, you end up wasting about 20 to 30 turns waiting for the next attempt. In fact, by the late game, you start hoping for the portals to open near your lord, so you can enter as quickly as possible. There's no incentive to expand or conquer, except to sustain an economy of the best 20 units in your faction leader's full stack. It's overall a very bad example of pacing that struggles to encapsulate the Warhammer trilogy's strengths, and is only carried by the strength of its narrative. Realm of Chaos again features a lot of movie sequences that detail the lore of the Chaos Gods, the role of the God Bear Urson, and his significance to the mortal races, which is one of the reasons why I encourage a Kislev playthrough. 
Despite the gameplay shortcomings, I still feel it's worth at least a speed through on easy mode because it continues the overall narrative arc. Narratively speaking, the Lost God into the Realm of Chaos is the episodic beginning of the Warhammer Trilogy story, which is then followed by Warhammer 2's Eye of the Vortex and ends with the Mortal slash Immortal Empire sandbox campaign. And so, I enjoyed the narrative arc for what it was. I enjoyed the final climactic battle with Bellacore and all the lore tidbits and storytelling media on display. I did, however, not enjoy the gameplay loop whatsoever. What a shame, but it proves the writing department over at Creative Assembly are competent and praiseworthy. Immortal Empires is the anticipated sequel to Warhammer 2's acclaimed Mortal Empires which combines all the races and legendary lords ever released into one giant world-sized map in a Total War Battle Royale. This is Warhammer 3's finest offering with insane amounts of replayability. 24 total races that each have one, two or even a few legendary lords each, including several minor factions that can also be commanded. What I like most, again I'm not a lore expert so I can't comment on accuracy, is the nevertheless reasonably balanced map that provides a lot of exposure to racial variety and diplomatic interaction. For instance, the Bretonians have two lords that start in the traditional Old World Bretonian lands, but another that starts in the Lustrian New World and another in Araby. Anywhere you start, you will have a variety of initial rivals and potential allies. For instance, if in the Old World you'll border some green skins and vampires, Dwarves and Wood Elves in the nearby ranges and the Empire across those mountains. Similar with the Dwarves who have some key starting positions in the Old World alongside a few exotic other locations. The developers have ensured that regions of the campaign map are not singularly homogenous to encourage replayability. In essence, every single Lord will have different initial challenges. The continent of Ulfwan is seen as a stronghold for the High Elves, but playing as any Lord starting here still brings you into conflict with Dark Elves, Vampire Coast Raids, and Greenskins, with the forces of Chaos making incursions in the north. The new regions of the Far East are a chaotic powder keg of Lords with the Lizardmen, Dark Elves, Chaos Dwarves, Skaven, Vampire Counts, and Chaos Warriors all represented in the traditional lands of Grand Cafe, making the latter a compelling choice for a playthrough. Perhaps the only real one-dimensional faction is ironically Kislev, where both of its starting Lords begin in the same region and so experience similar challenges. Boris Ursus is a hidden third leader that can be unlocked through completing a Kislevite mission tree in the Realm of Chaos campaign. He starts off a bit further north, closer to Norskin and Chaos factions, but otherwise still in the general vicinity. With minor factions, the total number present in Warhammer 3's Immortal Empires is an insane 280 factions, but many will be steadily culled as the turns wear on and will reach about 100 factions upon the mid-game. Because of its size, the Immortal Empire's map features sea lanes to assist long-distance movement. Any faction can utilize sea lanes to transport armies to far-off places in the world, taking two turns to traverse whilst skilled navigator races such as Norskins, Elves and Vampire Coasts only take one turn. One of the major campaign features introduced in Immortal Empires is the Endgame. With in-depth configuration options available, players can experience a multitude of events that trigger after a set number of turns, as opposed to just the Chaos Invasion from Warhammer 1 and 2. A warning will be issued in a customizable amount of turns, before triggering a random event chain that pits one of the evil antagonist factions as an apocalyptic harbinger of doom. Whatever the chosen race, they will immediately become hostile, begin expanding aggressively and receive several free armies to do so. The player will then have to conquer their capital province to secure ultimate victory. The great thing about this is it essentially provides a flexible degree of replayability as each scenario can spawn in different parts of the world map with different races involved and different event chains. The Vermintide Endgame spawns a large number of Skaven undercities across the world map, allowing the Skaven Plague to erupt from random corners of the globe. 
whilst the Vampiric Ascension event respawns all Vampire Count factions as hostile and gives them several gold veteran full stacks of elite units. For Masochist, there's also Ultimate Crisis Mode that triggers all endgame scenarios in the same campaign. In terms of gameplay, Warhammer 3 is functionally the same game as Warhammer 2 and even Warhammer 1 before it, with minor incremental improvements. One such improvement is in diplomacy. Deals can be balanced instead of micromanaging precise offers and demands. Allied intentions are shown directly on the campaign map to indicate their movements. A new allegiance system introduces a new resource that can be accrued passively or by completing missions for allies. Allegiance can then be used to issue war coordination targets, request entire armies on loan, or more interestingly, with the new outpost system. Allied nations can now construct outposts in each other's settlements, providing a foreign garrison whilst allowing recruitment of expeditionary troops for the other party. This allows factions to field units from other races by using Allegiance, allowing players to create cross-faction synergistic army lineups and overall forging compelling reasons to ally rather than subjugate. Now this could have been received brilliantly but unfortunately is anchored down due to fundamental problems with the AI, but the outpost concept is one that can be brought into future Total War titles. I'm actually quite disappointed in what hasn't been changed, because the gameplay loop does continue to be extremely stale after maybe the first 50 turns. I hardly ever maintain motivation to fully complete campaigns. Every faction follows a generalized formula in the grand strategy empire building process. I would say only the Skaven playstyle is radically unique here. Even the supposed premier factions feel incomplete. There's hardly any regiments of renown, for instance, and only two legendary lords apiece from the outset. The main element of diversity boils down to unique mechanics each race receives. The two Kislev factions tussle against each other for supporters. Whichever reaches the maximum limit confederates the other. They can invoke the power of their gods, each granting powerful global bonuses, and they govern their lands by delegating provinces to Adamans. Grand Café factions tread their progress through the balance of yin and yang. Keeping these elements in check invokes powerful bonuses, whilst in imbalance will cause penalties. They can also direct the winds of magic through the Wu Xing Compass, granting more bonuses, whilst their economy is built on the caravan mechanic, where they can send periodic trade convoys escorted by essentially mercenary armies to distant empires with various related events. Cafean factions are also tasked to protect the northern flank of the world behind their great bastion. The forces of chaos and disorder will periodically attempt to break through, and it's up to this race to prevent breaches and hold the line. Although there's no narrative to speak of in Immortal Empires, there's still plenty of opportunity to get immersed in the lore, through notable locations on the world map, and more randomized events to add flavor across campaigns, but many of these have been simply iterated on from previous games. Overall, the campaigns of Warhammer 3 is in no doubt an improvement on its predecessors. Quality of life improvements and a more intimate focus on world building elements combined with its all-encompassing scope presents Warhammer 3 as the pinnacle showcase of Warhammer Fantasy lore. This expansive setting however does expose and perhaps even exacerbate some of the worst traits of the Total War Warhammer trilogy. Repetition, diversity as an illusion, lack of polish and balance, mediocre AI, all culminating in an overall bare-bones campaign experience. These were all apparent issues in Warhammer 2, yet I feel the developers have not attempted to address these fundamental shortcomings well enough, instead prioritizing expanding the content at all costs. As such, it struggles to develop a nuanced campaign experience for each of the races and factions. As the roster of races has expanded, I feel like many of them have been lumped into certain playstyle groupings that struggles to individualize any of them. Three Kingdoms almost fell into this trap because in that context, all the factions are virtually the same, but somehow defined its core identity through a strong sense of characterization and storytelling, with different intervals of challenge dispersed throughout a campaign. 
Warhammer 3 is clearly very fun in its first dozen or so turns when the challenge and variety is at its best intensity, but drags into a slog late game with little incentive for the player, besides their own role-playing convictions. Regardless, I think the overwhelming strength of Warhammer 3 is still its ability to portray a global high fantasy war on such an impetuous scale with its Immortal Empires campaign. Pick one of the 24 races and just brawl it out. It's sort of like the novelty you get in the Super Smash Bros. franchise. There's a lot of characters to try out and it's fun for a round or two every once in a while. But unless you're a Warhammer fantasy devotee, there's not that much draw or pull to keep you that invested. Warhammer 3's most engrossing experience is in battle mode. With its audiovisual qualities and animation overhauls, the chaotic mumble jumble is at its peak. At the cost of any sense of realism or formation play, Warhammer 3 battles have embraced the three virtues of being bloody, messy, and downright fun. This mindless sensation is, I think, a purposeful direction Creative Assembly has taken. Instead of requiring complicated tactics or micromanagement, players can simply clash their armies together in a giant mess and watch the brawl on the ground. It's definitely the casualization of the Warhammer trilogy that makes it approachable for many newcomers. So veterans of Total War will be left a bit wanting the depth and nuance of historical titles. There are new quality of life features, such as in battle reinforcement, where the player can decide which direction reinforcements arrive at the cost of increased time to deploy. This somewhat makes up for the cap of 20 units per army as players can juggle two or more armies on the campaign map without awkwardly facing weird directions to force reinforcement from certain sides of the map. Assisting the new breadth of variety are new units that arrive with new factions. With all the races on display however, there is a disappointing sentiment that they aren't really unique from each other. There are unit similarities across the board. Kislev, Dwarves and Chaos Dwarves share essentially the same unit rosters with some cosmetic differences and outlying varieties. All three factions depend on the core of tanky, often gunpowder equipped infantry, with Kislev having an edge with their cavalry, Dwarves having their artillery and machines, and Chaos Dwarves having a variety of monsters. You can also see archetypal similarities with the Empire as well. And this sentiment is echoed with other factions. You have your swarmy factions that overwhelm with numbers, you have your ranged or archer factions that overpower from distance, and your super tanky factions that try to outsurvive by being big and beefy. Late game unique elite units, regiments of renown, and the overall great unit designs does superimpose over this issue, but it does tend to feel a bit repetitive when you dive deeper into different factions. Flying units now have a new quality of life feature in the flying toggle. This is actually a revelation and will allow for savvy players to maximize the effectiveness of their flying units in one of the few advantages the Warhammer series has over other Total Wars, the ability to battle in the airspace. Flying units are so interesting as they completely ignore the terrain during movement, making them especially useful in siege battles. But in previous Warhammer titles, committing flying units into ground fights often disables this aerial ability. Warhammer 3 suffers from a further degradation of formation play. Units constantly struggle to latch onto other units and engage in melee, more so compared to previous titles, and often seems like they phase through each other. This makes it very efficient to hold the line, but disadvantageous to actually chase and be the attacker. Large sized units such as monsters or cavalry have the opposite problem in that they get caught in or get stuck by smaller units and take some effort to detach them from the blob, often at the cost of high losses. I don't think morale is balanced well enough and leadership seems too polarized, especially between early mid and the late game periods. Battles suffer from a constant rout and rally pattern, forcing the players and AI to keep chasing broken units to ensure that they are shattered or leave the map, whilst the late game is filled with high morale units and leadership modifiers that force every single unit to fight to the death, often becoming a grindfest. This late game situation does improve formation play, however, and I find it more pleasant to hold proper line tactics and conduct hammer and anvil maneuvers with late game elite units. Unit balance, however, is all over the place. 
Grand Cafe's roster feels very weak due to their dependence on ranged units and get rolled over by tanky factions that can rush them, such as the Lizardmen. Kislev is another weak outlier. They just perform very poorly in respect to their neighbours and often worsens their starting challenge. The Wood Elves have been too strong since the first Total War Warhammer, whilst the new Chaos races such as Korn have proven to be problematic. I think Warhammer 3 would do well with an overall pass or two on unit balancing. The cinematic nature of battles is elevated with animation overhauls across the board. So if unit variety and tactical nuance is less than pleasing, their dramatic portrayal in battles are a feast on the eyes and ears, and most players will probably opt to rather just watch it unfold on the ground than to have any semblance of control. Between legendary lords, there are custom synced or matched combat animations that portray dueling. Large monsters have certain kill animations. And of course, the Blood DLC improves this aspect with its range of decapitation and dismemberment. Some players dislike the animation system as it is often janky and aggravates poor unit balancing, but I think that Warhammer 3 has already pushed the limits of the Warscape engine as much as it can. I'd rather gorgeous cinematics and over-the-top animations than an attempt at proper combat simulation, which clearly doesn't work for this fantasy setting. I don't want to leave it up to the imagination on how my units fight, like on tabletop. I'd rather see it come to life. As a result, it's recommended to view the Warhammer trilogy as a sort of escapism from traditional Total War, and also a larger-than-life visual portrayal of Warhammer Fantasy tabletop, however unrealistic, unfaithful, or unbalanced it really is. Sieges have also been reworked extensively in Warhammer 3. Taking on the dynamism of quest battles from the story campaigns, maps have been rebuilt to take into account new localities or redesigned cities, such as the Great Bastion protecting the borders of Northern Cafe. The supply system encourages the capture and holding of points to generate a new resource. This can then be exchanged to build towers or barriers for the defender, providing a cutting-edge advantage that wasn't present in previous Total War titles. Attackers still have an incentive to capture these points as it makes their assault easier. Sieges have overall improved, but it still suffers from AI issues such as paving and decision making, which can ruin immersion and result in cheese ability for the player. And because of how annoying sieges are in campaign, it makes any improvement pretty redundant for the majority of players. It takes like 9 turns to fully attrition out the enemy. All of the races have the same siege engines, and there's very little unique siege-related mechanics in campaign mode, so most players skip or auto-resolve sieges anyway, lessening their exposure to this new system. Battles can be decided way too fast, and can be influenced way too much by overpowered and high-level lords. Units are imbalanced and not that different from each other when you peel back the layers. But there's just something about Warhammer 3 battles, especially in the late game, that shines as the plethora of magical spells and wide range of fantasy units clash together in a brilliant audio-visual miasma, which simply cannot be replicated in any other game medium. Despite the struggles of the AI, inherent paving and collision issues which leaves the overall experience more to be desired, battles are nevertheless the best of what Warhammer 3 offers and the major part of its appeal. As we know, Total War Warhammer 3 released in a dire state of affairs. A relatively quiet and unproductive first few months post-launch did nothing to abate the negative reviews and clamour for increased communication. The period ending in 2022 and going into 2023 has proven to be much better for this third Warhammer game, especially with the introduction of some critical updates, the accompanying content DLCs and some major feature additions and reworks. As of the writing of this video, Warhammer 3 has currently undergone three major patch cycles with update 4.0 scheduled for release sometime soon this year. Much of the first cycle focused on adding much needed regiments of renown to the seven new factions, Kislev, Grand Cafe, Ogre Kingdoms and the four Chaos God races. Which means that, although these factions were the new shiny toys launched since day one, 
we had to wait for the developers to actually implement some unique regiments for them. Given that many of these factions still only have four, a low number compared to other races, I really don't get what the hell they were doing releasing these races and frankly this entire game in such a bare bones state. With update 2.0 in August 2022 came the Immortal Empires campaign release with the Champions of Chaos and Blood for the Blood God DLCs. And to be completely frank, Warhammer 3 should have been delayed until these were ready. It meant that players who opted in early had to wait 6 months for the minimum expected Total War experience, as Immortal Empires is really the best mode worth playing and what many Total War veterans and newcomers base the majority of their opinions around. To say otherwise is to encourage incomplete titles to release for full price whilst the fanbase is forced to wade through what was essentially an extended beta. I know it also happened with Mortal Empires and Warhammer 2, but fans should have really pressured the developers harder to nip that practice then and there. What's funny is that technically Immortal Empires launched in beta and only came out of beta with update 2.4 in February of 2023. So like another six months was spent beta testing this new mode anyway. One change that they did implement thanks to intense public pressure was that players did not have to own the previous two titles in order to play Immortal Empires. They still can't automatically play all the races from those two games, but at least they can still launch the mode and enjoy some of the new races. Imagine paying for all three games and still beta testing. Well, that was the situation before February of this year. Update 3.0 launched in April of 2023 and supported the Forge of the Chaos Dwarfs DLC with free content in the Mirror of Madness. We are currently in this update cycle and the developers have outlined their general plans for the rest of the year and beyond. The most notable change was the rework of the Warriors of Chaos race in the 2.0 update cycle. There is now a greater emphasis towards the four Chaos Gods in Khorne, Nurgle, Slanesh and Zinch. All Chaos factions can gain or lose authority with each of these gods, or prefer an undivided axis to supplement a generalist approach. Prince Sigvald, for instance, is a dedicated servant of Slanesh, so is naturally more inclined to their patron, but is neutral or negatively stanced with the others. Belakor, Kolek Sun Eater, and Archaon the Everchosen start undivided with equal appreciation of all Chaos gods. Chaos units are then differentiated into the standard Undivided variant and variants for all four Chaos Gods. Corn units, for instance, all have Frenzy, whilst Nurgle units all have innate poison attacks. This allows players to specialize in certain strategies or mix and match the best from all four Gods. The Warriors of Chaos now feature Warband recruitment. They can instantly recruit from a limited pool of units depending on where armies are on the world map. Buildings and terrain features will dictate recruitable units. For instance, Chaos Trolls are more likely to be found in mountainous terrain. This is very similar to the area of recruitment mechanic that was introduced in Rome 2, allowing for dynamic army rosters and encouraging player adaptability. These units can then be upgraded through the Warband Upgrade Tree upon reaching experience requirements, allowing for a more organic progression of unit capability. Finally, all factions in this race can gather souls through battle, which can then be exchanged for gifts of chaos and attracting divine attention through the eye of the gods, or in other minor mechanics such as character paths of glory. These are overall superb changes that make the Warriors of Chaos some of the more fun and dynamic factions to play today in Warhammer 3. The Monogod factions that were introduced in the base game don't feature alongside this rework and so retain most of their vanilla mechanics. I'm not sure where I stand on this as I would quite like all the Chaos factions to play with this new rework. There's also a variety of free OC available to opt in by opening a CA account and linking your Steam or Epic Games account. In previous titles one had to proceed through the Total War dashboard. This system was formerly called Total War Access. But now the process is much more streamlined as simply linking one time will hopefully just auto redeem anything free the devs release in the future. Of course anything redeemed from the previous games are available instantly such as the Gotrek and Felix event line. Warhammer 3 brings two new legendary lords for free, Ulrika Magdova and Harold Hammerstorm. 
Ulrika is an immortal vampire that can be attached to armies and provide a stealthy, assassin-like hero with decent ranged and melee combat ability. The quest chain to unlock her is available to either Kislev or the Empire. Harald Hammerstorm is an avatar of Chaos with exceptional melee ability, making him a ferocious inclusion in the Chaos arsenal. Harold's unlock quest chain is available to the Warriors of Chaos race. The Ogre Kingdom's race pack was a day one DLC released concurrently alongside Warhammer 3's launch. It introduces two factions for the race of Ogre Kingdoms, brutish humanoids that inhabit the mountains between the Darklands and Grand Cafai. Greasus Goldtooth leads his namesake tribe in the midst of these lands, contending against other rival Ogre Kingdoms, Greenskin and Dwarven Holds, with Skaven, Vampire Counts, Chaos Dwarves and Grand Cafai on the peripheries. Because Ogre Kingdoms can't utilize the Underway, I feel this is one of the harder starts for any campaign as their immediate enemies all have access to it and can maneuver through the mountain terrain easier. Scrag the Slaughterer leads the Disciples of the Moor. They spawn much closer to the Old World in the Western Borders, contending against the Empire and Dwarves, with Greenskin encroachments further out. Overall, the Ogre Kingdoms start in such forgettable positions that it almost feels as if their starting challenge wasn't given much thought, almost as if they were planned to be within the base game. The Ogre Kingdoms have several unique mechanics, most importantly revolving around meat an army-specific resource. This can be gained post-battle or generated with certain buildings, and it's used primarily during pre-battle feasts to give combat buffs or offer to the Great Maw, a religious deity of the Ogres, for campaign bonuses. However, having a deficiency of meat will then cause attrition to the army in question. Furthermore, they can construct ogre camps in any arbitrary location, rather than depending on a network of settlements. Ogre camps are limited in number, but it unlocks the race's important building chains, provides another queue for reinforcement, a garrison location to interdict traffic, and provides buffs for any army in an area around it, such as providing meat. As such, they are especially crucial in mountain passes or within enemy territory to provide a fallback position. Finally, Ogre Kingdoms also feature some smaller mechanics such as contracts and big names for characters. Ogre Kingdoms are quite cumbersome to play, no pun intended, and if it wasn't for their satisfying performance in battle, clobbering and clattering with their high unit mass and destructive momentum, they would be the weakest race in the game. Their dependence on meat means that they must keep attacking or awkwardly move around their campsites, but at the same time they lack unit variety and late game sustainability. Some of their campaign mechanics can be interesting, but their starting positions are so poorly fought out that it's a real chore to play either faction. A massive DLC letdown that is only partially salvaged by their somewhat fun battle experience. With Warhammer 3's expansion to the east, the Ogre Kingdoms naturally had to have been included. Creative Assembly however decided to implement them as a day one paid DLC in a very uninspired way. The Champions of Chaos DLC launched in August of 2022, alongside the massive Immortal Empires and Chaos rework update. As such, it introduces four new legendary lords for the Warriors of Chaos race, but each of these lords have particular affinity to one of the four Chaos gods. Valkyr the Bloody is the consort of Khorne, and starts in the northwestern parts of Nagarov. Festus the Leech Lord is a doctor turned Nurgle enthusiast, beginning his campaign in the midst of the Empire at Brass Keep. Azazel leads Lanesh's legions in the northern approaches to Kislev, whilst the twinned monstrosity village formulate Zinch's plans to dominate northeastern Kafai. Each of these factions feature mechanics from the monogod chaos races. Valkyr has the same corn mechanic as Scarbrand with bloodletting. The more battle victories in quick succession, the more bonuses they receive. Likewise, Festus can also induce plagues alongside Kugaf with the Plague Cauldron mechanic. And so, the identity of this DLC is kind of weird. It's almost as if these lords should have been added into each of the monogod races, as each of them cannot interact with any other gods and have their own god-restricted units. But at the same time, it's as if Creative Assembly needed to show off the Chaos rework and justify a DLC price tag by implementing them into the wider Warriors of Chaos roster. 
As such, they feel more limited compared to the vanilla Chaos Lords. It should have been like Prince Zigvold's execution. He has starting affinity with Slanesh but can recruit from the entire Chaos pool and change his godly allegiance if the player so chooses. The Champions of Chaos sit in an awkward niche between the recently reworked and highly enjoyable Warriors of Chaos and the mostly vanilla and quite boring in retrospect monogod factions in Scarbrand, Kugath, Enkari and Kairos Fateweaver. A confusing execution that sums up Creative Assembly's early DLC releases. Forge of the Chaos Dwarfs released in April of 2023 and introduces the eagerly awaited namesake race that inhabits the dark lands between Kafai and the Old World. With a defining steampunk identity, the race is commanded by three lords. Astrogoth Ironhand leads the disciples of Hashut in the Upper Darklands. Drazoth the Ashen leads the Legion of Asgore in the Lower Darklands and Zatan the Black leads the war host of Tsar in the northern foothills of the Ogre Kingdoms. Their starting positions are interesting as they can be involved with conflicts against High Elves, Vampire Counts, Greenskins, Ogre Kingdoms and of course other Dwarfs. Chaos Dwarfs are one of the more unique races to wield. They are considered a Chaos Undivided faction and so spread corruption. They feature two critical resources besides gold in raw materials and armaments. The former is needed to construct buildings, whilst armaments are needed to increase unit caps and upgrade them via the Hellforge. Players must decide whether settlements are geared towards raw material mining as an outpost or producing armaments as a factory. Furthermore, Chaos Dwarf provinces require a quota of slave labor as resource buildings use this up as upkeep. As such, to maintain efficient production within their settlements, Chaos Dwarfs must continually gather slaves through battle and conquest. Slaves can also be consumed to rush construction of buildings, instantly completing them. Chaos Dwarfs also gather Conclave influence, similar to the race of Kislev, but instead use them in the Tower of Tsar to claim seats for faction rewards. Factions can also usurp other seats in an attempt to control entire districts and advance up the Conclave Tower for even greater bonuses. Finally, the military convoy feature mimics the Kafayan caravan mechanic, where Chaos Dwarves can send periodic convoys to distant realms and trade their variety of resources in gold, raw materials, armaments or labour. The Chaos Dwarf roster consists of expendable orc and goblin units used as meat shields, a backbone of more typical beefier dwarven infantry, alongside a range of centaur and volcanic monsters, as well as their own models of war machines. Although they do somewhat mimic the dwarves in roster and battle playstyles, just with their own darker flavor on top, their variety in auxiliary units is enough to paint them in some unique light. They're pretty enjoyable to play, all things considered, but I think they are overall a weaker race on the campaign map, as they juggle too many resources and thus tend to stutter in their campaign progress. The race also includes itself in a new endgame scenario, the Will of Hashut, creating Chaos Dwarf invasion tunnels across major cities around the world and spawning hostile army stacks. So there's some potential in interacting with Chaos Dwarfs, even without playing as them. As has happened across this entire trilogy, the modding scene is one of the few beacons of hope for the game's future. Quite possibly possessing the largest modding scene in Total War history, the 10,000 accumulated mods on Steam Workshop is well on its way to surpassing Warhammer 2's 12,000 mods and already greatly outnumbering historical titles such as Rome 2. There's just something so professional, so passionate and so consistent about the Warhammer modding community, I can't quite pinpoint on why that is. Perhaps the fans that truly enjoy the game are so rabid about Warhammer Fantasy that they are also willing to pour hours outside the game into enhancing it. Perhaps there are some that feel for the price that they paid, they're trying to compensate to make the game better. Psychoanalysis aside, players buying into the Warhammer 3 project who love to mod, who love to download mods, will have no regrets on this front. Warhammer 3 is the great stereotype of shoddy AAA releases. Buy an unfinished product and wait for the devs to fix or complete it, or perhaps depend on its zealous community to mod it. Well, it still ain't finished, putting it mildly, as Warhammer 3 embraces the games as a service business model. 
but at least Creative Assembly seems ready for the long ride, with the recent roadmap indicating post-release support past 2024 and beyond. But it hasn't been anything like smooth sailing to salvage the release reputation. Uninspired DLC releases, content that arrives too little or too late, New modes like Mirror of Madness get dustbinned and forgotten by Creative Assembly after they launch. Most of the focus is on Immortal Empires, rightly so. But when that starts to feel repetitive, there's not much else that's fun to fall back on, despite the seemingly constant stream of new content offered. The Total War Warhammer Trilogy's pricing model is downright confusing for new and returning players alike, so we'll break it down here. The recent ownership revisions mean that players owning Warhammer 3 will have access to all of its modes, including Immortal Empires, but only its base roster of races. Kislev, Grand Cafe, Demons of Chaos, Belakor's Shadow Legion for the Warriors of Chaos, and the four Chaos God mono races in Korn, Nurgle, Slanesh, and Zinch. The paid DLCs of this game introduce Ogre Kingdoms and Chaos Dwarfs. Owning Warhammer 1 will unlock Dwarfs, Greenskins, the Empire, and Vampire Counts. Paid DLCs from that game further unlock Warriors of Chaos, the Beastmen, Norska, and Wood Elves with Bretonia as a free LC. Owning Warhammer 2 will unlock Dark Elves, High Elves, Lizardmen and Skaven, with paid DLC unlocking Tomb Kings and the Vampire Coast. But there's also several more DLCs that add only legendary lords for the aforementioned races. Warhammer 3's Champions of Chaos is one such example, but the rest of the DLC library is truly extensive across the three titles. Suffice to say, this is an extremely expensive game, or series of games, to invest in. With all three games and all DLCs pushing past 400 US dollars total, the playing experience and ultimately any judgment of Warhammer 3 is thus linked to what one can afford or what one has already purchased, not just in this third game but the previous two. Nonetheless, Warhammer 3's base game is the same $60 price tag as the previous two with very limited sales since launch. With that in mind, we move on to our ratings. Warhammer 3 in 2023 is brimming with content. Its titular Immortal Empires is the final culmination of the trilogy's races and lords into an expansive global map. But there's plenty of other smaller bite-sized chunks of content. It also sees a vast improvement in storytelling and lore-building elements that help to immersively portray the fantasy universe. However, new races in Kislev, Grand Cafe, and the revised Chaos Forces all have slightly irritating elements to their execution despite being the game's premier races, 8 out of 10. Highlights in the UI improvements and soundscaping is let down by lethargic engine performance and continual AI issues that have plagued this series since the first Total War Warhammer. Perhaps Warhammer 3 will never truly wrestle away from the trilogy's bug-ridden and unoptimized reputation, we will just have to wait and see. But in some regards, the engine, unsurprisingly, can't keep up with the soaring ambition and scope of this game. 5 out of 10. The story campaigns don't really feel like Total War, but they depict the narrative well enough and kept my attention at least. The piece de resistance, Immortal Empires mode, has to be commended for its grandiose scale and ambition for being the largest map in Total War history and providing a playground for the game's 24 races. There's some interesting improvements from its predecessors, but for the most part the campaign experience in Warhammer 3 is a decent continuation, if at times a little repetitive. 7 out of 10. Battles feature their fair share of awe and wow factor, crisp animations, an assortment of new maps, units and effects, as well as a rework of sieges. All of this culminates in the most appealing fantasy battle engine on the market that is probably more valuable for its cinematic rather than tactical qualities. There's still something so satisfying about mindless and disorganized clobbering in a fantasy setting that has drawn players back for round 3, 9 out of 10. Real, real condolences to those who have suffered through the first six months of launch. 
Since then, Warhammer 3 has improved leaps and bounds, but the game is nowhere near ready to be labelled as finished, and we can expect further development as Creative Assembly milks this cash cow. They're going to have to improve their paid DLCs though, but does it really matter if people keep buying them anyway? Hmm, 4 out of 10. Warhammer 3 is nowhere near one of Total War's greats, yet, because nor is it a finished product. With a final score of 6.5 out of 10, the overall product today is decent, but considering the price of entry, you have to treat this as an investment or a comeback again in the future and reassess. Just an uninspired DLC with very little content, Ogre Kingdom should have been given a better treatment as one of the anticipated new factions arriving in this edition. At least for its price, it is quite inexpensive. Thanks to their utilization of the Warriors of Chaos rework, this is a solid DLC that delivers decent variety for one of the more fun races to play. There's just a feeling that they should have been implemented like the other Warriors of Chaos Lords or given specialty treatment as part of the Monogod races. Upon this launching, Creative Assembly decreed that anyone that has owned Blood for the Blood God from either of the previous two games won't need to purchase this. So why does this cost more than the other two? To punish single copy owners of just Warhammer 3, of course. A pitiful scam. Undoubtedly, Warhammer 3's best DLC so far, the steady improvement has shown that maybe Creative Assembly can slowly salvage paid content for the future. The real kicker is the price. At $24.99 US dollars, it rivals full blown expansion pack prices from other titles, and so deserves a serious think from potential purchasers. For players that have sunken too much cost to even call it a fallacy anymore, the extra $60 is probably just a small extra price tag for what it offers, as the content all carries over. Warhammer Fantasy fans looking for the definitive adaptation of the tabletop should be hesitant to go diving head first, unless they have money to spare. Newcomers interested in exploring this universe should definitely wait for a sale considering the potential total cost, whilst I see little value to recommend for players uninterested in Warhammer Fantasy, including Total War veterans that are used to more nuanced historical settings. It just doesn't offer enough fundamentally as a unique Total War game. Total War Warhammer 3 has the potential to be Creative Assembly's magnum opus. Like Warhammer 2, it may take many more years before all of its development and content releases mature into a worthwhile product that will cement its legacy as a definitive fantasy total war. Its potential is indeed palpable and very much attainable. But after seven years of Warhammer, fans and veterans and perhaps even Creative Assembly themselves will be excited to close out this chapter and move on to newer pastures. This was Total War Warhammer 3 a year in review. This channel is dedicated to discussing gaming content in a deeper and more analytical manner. If you enjoyed this content, consider subscribing and maybe supporting us further on Patreon for as little as a dollar a month.